Hello everyone on this uh, rainy day. I was in a bit of a hurry here uh, and I made the last video as I thought YouTube were going to shut down their marvellous video editing suite. They haven't yet done so, even though it was planned, they let it run on. So that gives me more time to remake a video that I rushed a bit the last time concerning this business. What you see there, right in the middle of the picture, is the top of the rear column. You see there? That's the rear column where the beam used to sit on it. The beam is here, this beam. Now I've noticed since I made the last videos that uh, they, they cut round the top of the column there to facilitate the building coming apart. I'd auto, auto, also noticed when they demolished it, that column came clean in half. So they'd actually pre-weakened, well, they'd actually cut all the way around it there. Now, uh, of course, I'm assuming that there may be tabs and wedges left, but uh, nonetheless, just a little uh, point to make. Most buildings, the connections between the columns and the cross pieces are a bit flexible. So if you lift a column up off the ground, all that happens is that there's a the flex in the joints. I don't know if you can see that. The, fle the flex in the joints allows the uh, frame to uh, accommodate any movement. Problem with the uh, three columns are talking about there is that there was this incredibly rigid beam that went across the top of all three of them. That beam is uh, 16 feet by four. I've seen the drawings. Me stood on tiptoe, level with the bottom of it. I couldn't even touch the, the halfway well join. That's fantastically rigid. So, any settling of the, any shortening of the center column would basically probably take, uh, well, it would, it would take a lot of weight off it because the beam is so rigid, it wouldn't want the flex. So uh, all it would do is uh, transfer more, lots more weight from the middle columns to the one at the front, and the one at the back. That there is the one at the back after it had failed. What you're looking at there is, well, here's the column, there, that bit there's a pad. That was a me metal pad welded to the top of the column. Because of huge temperature changes, the beam rested across the top of it. As the building fl uh, flexed, that could rock on the column. Because actually what would happen is the column itself would flex backwards and forwards slightly. So that pad was a rocking pad for the, uh, to accommodate for movement. B wasn't actually connected to the column. It, it was only connected to the middle. Now, uh, what they appear to have done is they've cut all the way around there, all the way around there, and all the way around there, leaving the side plate still attached to the top. And because it's symmetrical, one can reasonably speculate that they've done the same thing on the other side. And I've prepared this model a bit better to demonstrate what I mean, because I'm now not rushing so much. Still having to do things one-handed though. Let me, excuse me. Arr. Let me uh, get this thing apart. Let me take a side plate off for. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing wrong. I'm trying to take it apart the wrong way. That's why. There you go. That top weld broke. There's a weld across the top there between the top and the side plate which uh, had broken and uh, what's happened is the side plate has dived underneath in fact it's actually folded in two there I actually just see it folded in two and the top plate has uh, settled down so the side plate has folded over oh, I can't flex it am I it's folded right over and it's gone underneath the top plate and the top has come over it like that. So it comes in. Oops. 
Oh dear, I've done a false again. But it's come over, so the whole thing is bent up like that. And uh, that's what you're seeing. If you look at that, you're, you're seeing it from roughly that angle. And uh, that's what you're looking at there. And uh, quite a mess, isn't it? Now, uh, but that, that weld there hasn't separated from there. That's the model falling apart. It was actually more like that. And uh, so uh, that's where the uh, center column, that's where the center column ended up. The, the sorry, the end column ended up. There's the beam there. And the center column's about there. And uh, so that's, that was the only column that was actually connected to the beam front and back were uh, on these kind of pivot pad things. That's very common in engineering, actually. Uh, you know, the famous Hammersmith flyover stands on 13 pillars, and only the middle pillar is actually rigidly attached to the ground. The other six either side are actually on special roller bearings, so the whole flyover can get longer and shorter as weather changes. Uh, that's the one that had to be fixed recently when they discovered corrosion and the tension bars, but uh, that's another story altogether. That beam incredibly rigid along its whole length any settling of the middle column would try and bend that beam and of course all it would do is throw a lot of weight onto the front column and the back column one one of which had been heavily pre-weakened and by back column i mean the one nearest the chimney side of the building not the control room and uh, so just another point I don't know if I pointed this out. That is amazingly rigid. So if I wanted to make the building more rigid, if I'd done some calculations and found out that it was too flexible and, it, and uh, needed more rigidity, I could take a truss like that, attach it to the column solidly, and that would make the building more rigid. And uh, you can see that they've done that there. That's what those are. You can see them on the end, end of the building when you look at the uh, pictures of the wreckage. And... Uh, no, the building was flexible, and uh, obviously in one, they actually decided that from front to back it was too flexible and put that extra bit of bracing in, and uh, that's a huge beam. That is, that is actually the biggest beam I've ever seen, even, even bigger than the ones on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. It's enormous, and uh, 16 feet by 4. If it was in this room, the top of it would be in a would probably be in our attic. It's, uh, it's that big. It's difficult to get your head around the scale of that. And there's a footpath across the top of it. It's just the width of the beam. People walk along it. You can see a handrail. And uh, I've, seen, I've seen drawings at 16 feet by 4. So that's basically two 8 by 4 sheets of plywood stood end on end. On end. And uh, it's so big, I wonder how they got it there. I, th I almost think it would have been fabricated on site. I do know when they built the Sydney Harbour Bridge, they set up a place on the uh, shore and they built a factory where they could fabricate all the beams. But the Sydney Harbour Bridge, they riveted them together, not welded them. And uh, the plate, the beams, the plates were so flexible that uh, could they get them to sit down flat for riveting? The, you'd only get two or three workmen stand on top of the plates to, to flatten out any warps. And uh, they... And it's amazing to think that steel is that flexible when it's not in a structure. And uh, there are other videos, and you'll see me standing on a beam with the Sydney Bridge in the background, and it's just made of those four flexible plates, and I can put my whole weight on it, you know, they don't fold up, simply because they're in the shape of a box column. And uh, but the, what they did in the end then is when the bridge was built, they dismantled the factory and they turned it into a theme park and uh, called Luna Park. And that was basically the city's gift to its people for putting up with all the disruption for the uh, bridge building. And uh, there's a, another view of it there. The, uh, there's your mangled up end that I've just been talking about. There's the middle column where it had been designed to come apart. But what you can't see, and I think it might even be there, is that they actually cut all the way around it. And that survived, that survived the collapse of the building. Absolutely fine, you take this column. Let's, let's demonstrate. Again, I've covered this in other videos. But 
column can be part of, and again, I've actually sat on this column, it's absolutely fine. It has no problem taking any real weight. The trouble is, if they've cut a gap, if they've cut all the way around it to make, and made a gap with the uh, gas torch, and then the column has settled down, making it a little bit shorter, then uh, that beam, they'll be effectively trying to bend that beam a little bit, and it wouldn't uh, oblige. It, it, it would be to bend that beam any amount would mean a massive transfer of rate of many at least many hundreds of tons from the middle column to the two uh, either end and uh, I wonder if they took that into account when they were pre-weakening them and uh, yeah, that is stupidly rigid that beam now uh, these plates that little resting plate that pad now that's not only a pivot pad, that the purpose of that, and this is common engineering practice, is when they build a building and they put columns up, it's always, you know, you can never absolutely guarantee getting all the columns exactly level. And when you've got something that's as rigid as that beam, you would need them to be perfectly level. So they would have sighted across the tops of the, the columns. They would have sighted across the tops of the columns they would have made a note of any discrepancies of height and they would have had those plates, those pads, those plates custom machined to the correct size to make up for any discrepancies so that when they put the beam on, that beam would be absolutely flat and straight and there would be no bending load on it because uh, it wouldn't tolerate any bending load. It would try to just stay straight and create all sorts of out of balance stresses and the three columns holding it up instead. And... Uh, and I've taken that one into account. Somebody once asked me, um, what would I have done? What would I do? And uh, I've since come up with a solution to what I would do. Quite simple. I would get the people who construct these buildings in the first place to come up with a demolition plan. Because what's happening is demolition companies are having to second guess what was going through the minds of the engineers who designed it in the first place. And... Uh, if the designers had to file a, a proposed demolition plan, it would give them much more thought as to how it should be done. And uh, even to the point of where they would, could accommodate features into the building that would facilitate its dismantling. And, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, when we built West Mill Wind Farm, the, uh, the council were worried that if the uh, project went bankrupt, that they would be lumbered with five uh, windmill towers that I'd have to take down. So uh, we not only filed a proposed uh, dismantling plan, we actually left, uh, left them the, the money to do it. So the council have got 50,000 of our pounds of our money sat in a bank account, and it's, pro it's, it's simply there so that if the project should fail, they can use it to uh, commission people to take it down. Yeah, it's a shame the atomic power industry don't have to operate with such restrictions, but there you go. Um, I'm not bitter, he says. Anyway, uh, back to this thing. It's such a shame that it was never repurposed as a, a sports hall. It would have made a fantastic indoor sports arena. We're taking these big buildings down that are basically... were almost given to us by the taxpayer because they finished their original purpose and they were so easy to modify they were so easy to modify it didn't have to be a great big square lump on the horizon they could have repurposed things rearranged things quite easily and uh, I've got a picture with uh, a building which has got big planters on the side full of like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon that building was incredibly strong. It would have taken the weight of all that with the boilers out, no problem. And uh, what the possibilities that could have been done with that station, it's a shame that we're just tearing these things down and turning them to mindless housing estates and uh, instead of realising the gift that they really are. But uh, hopefully one or two people might come to their senses before they're all destroyed. But uh, I live in hope yet. You know, you wouldn't pull down a Hermitage or Buckingham Palace because you've decided you'd had enough of it. There'd be an outrage. Yet these things are every bit as magnificent. But uh, we didn't recognise it as such. And uh, tragedy was the result. But anyway, never mind. Still, um, 
I don't think I have anything else to say. This will probably be the last video, which is why I'm just kind of concluding. Uh, or concluding with an introduction. That makes sense, doesn't it? And uh, I think I'll leave it there. Oh, oh yeah, one last word. I was going to edit them all to make one video, but uh, I'm not going to get around to it. So there's going to be lots of repetition and me going over the same ground, etc., etc., and all of them, because I was supposed to be edited, but I'm not going to get around to do it. So I've just put them all up as a series. And uh, I've done that because there's a great, there are graduate engineers who are studying the collapse of the building, and uh, they value the opinion of somebody who worked in it and understood the building, how, how it operates how it works structurally and uh, some of the subtleties. So uh, as you say, the, it's up there for the uh, scientists and the engineers to pick through and uh, for the benefit of spreading knowledge, which after all was what this was about. And, uh, but yeah, I'll conclude with that, uh, the top of that column. Funny thing is, I'm not sure if that's the column that failed first. I, I just have a suspicion at the the actual column on the opposite end the same column on the opposite end let go first if that column if this is the end of unit two and that's the column we've just been talking about i have a sneaking suspicion the column that actually fell was this one and uh, it dropped this end of the top steel down and then it all set off from there and uh, but that's just speculation one of the things you will find I don't know if I've covered this, is that if you look at some of the pictures of the wreckage, one of these huge girders, and they were 13 feet deep, they were massive, one of these girders has been completely ripped out of the top steel and has rested along there somewhere, and you're thinking, how on, how on earth did that happen? Well, the top steel went over the column, went over the columns on this side, and the column at this end punched its way up through it and explained in other videos and ended up sitting on top of the building like a giant pickup stick. The column on this one may well have folded in two. And again, this is pure speculation. And as it did so, it got caught under the beam as it fell. And uh, steel has tremendous dynamic buckling resistance. That's why a nail doesn't shatter when you hit it with a hammer. You know, when you, you subject steel to a sudden, very high impact load, it'll actually resist. And so if this came down the top of that column that was wedged, wedged under it, it folded up and a piece of it had wedged under the girder. As the rest of it fell, that column it would have been strong enough to resist this thing trying to smack it into the ground. And so it would have pulled this girder out, right out of the frame, ripping it off its uh, bolt, bolt of the ends and throwing it onto the middle of the building. And uh, that, that gives you an indication of the huge forces that were involved when this thing came down. Absolutely uh, scary. Anyway, um, RIP to those uh, lost. And uh, I hope this uh, helps explain possibly what happened, at least until the official findings come out. Um, official findings could grind on for years and years and years, so at least this is something to be going on meanwhile. And uh, cheers then, and goodbye. <laughs>